Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a huge collection of videos on monster ecology, fantasy world history, cosmology, character classes and magic items on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button down below or backing me on Patreon where you can get access to all the scripts I write for these vids if you prefer to read what I'm saying. I also have a Discord server with an active community and of course subscribe to me here for two uploads per week and with a live stream every weekend. By popular and consistent demand from my viewers, today we are delving into the lore of a terrifying creature of darkness, the Night Walker, sometimes known as the Night Stalker. Also known as, oh no, we're in some pretty shit now, game over man, game over. If you thought a lich was bad, they are finger puppets compared to what I'm going to show you. So sit back, grab a tasty beverage and turn the lights off because we're going to get deeply scary. There are those who believe that in order for there to be heroes, there must also be things that should be, must be feared, even by the most brave soul, that there can be no true reward without true risk. The negative energy plane lies beyond the plane of shadows. It has doorways connecting it to the most dark and evil places in the Shadowfell. It drains away the multiverse through countless tiny wounds from the entropic hunger of the undead, from the little slices that wizards, necromancers and profane priests tear in the planes of light and life, and their short-sighted greed for power. The negative energy plane is a yawning and eternal gulf of complete darkness that could easily swallow up the entire multiverse without even touching its sides. It would hunger forever for more, and there's no fighting it. It is the end of all things. It was always going to win. Every effort to keep it at bay is just the struggles of a flickering candle as it burns its own wax. The brighter it shines, the faster it will eventually gutter and die. To the beings that exist within the negative energy plane, the multiverse is an aberration. It is disorder and noise that disturbs their stillness and peace. It is a mistake, a shrieking hot needle in their eyes. Everything about it is wrong and simply must be stopped. It causes them sensations they should not have, cravings that they can never satisfy, madness they can't endure, emotions they can't control. To them, the prime material plane is the far realm. It's a realm of madness that corrupts and destroys everything it touches, and it must be stopped. There are so many things that mortal beings don't want to understand about the negative energy plane, because it is too painful for mortal creatures to live without hope. A confrontation with a Nightwalker is very difficult for a mortal to understand, so they interpret it in terms that are convenient and safe lies. The most common way for a Nightwalker to enter the Prime Material Plane is when a being from the Prime thinks that they have found a way to tap into the negative energy plane's infinite power without risk to themselves. They have avoided the unholy process of anchoring their soul as a conduit to the negative energy plane and transforming themselves into one of the undead. They've created some form of a gateway, and they've reached into it to bring forth raw negative force for whatever purpose they had in mind. But what inevitably happens next is that they find themselves suddenly within the negative energy plane, as though they had fallen through a mirror and were looking out on something which now stands where they once were. Something huge and utterly dark, which was simply waiting for this moment to arrive. On other occasions, foolish mortals will attempt to cross over into the negative energy plane willingly, thinking themselves protected by their feeble magical barriers and careful preparations. But what they've not counted on is the actual nature of the barrier between the prime material universe and the negative plane itself. Once they arrive and attempt to leave, they find they can't. Stepping through the barrier, it's as though the whole multiverse just accelerated at near infinite speed, with the mortal ever so slowly falling through the barrier, like a bug being swallowed by tree sap, moving a tiny bit from eon to eon. The mortal perfectly preserved as they move through to the other side, the multiverse running out of energy, time, life and light behind them, until they pop back through and suddenly find themselves at the other end of the multiverse, on the other side of time itself. That's why it's so much easier to get there than it is to leave. To travel forward in time, one simply needs to freeze, but to go backwards in time requires tremendous power. 
Wizards will tell you it's a magical issue, an arcane problem with arcane solutions. Clerics will tell you it's a barrier put in place by the gods to preserve the world of light from the darkness, a barrier not meant to be crossed by good-hearted souls. For the Nightwalker, rising its towering 20-foot-tall body to float a few inches off the ground, it has no illusions about where it is or what it's there for. It has that huge source of power at the very disturbance caused by the immortal simply arriving and existing in that distant time. Like it was drawing all the potential of it from history and burning it like fuel. Every moment the Night Stalker is on the Prime Material Plane, it feels that mortal keenly. There is a bond and connection between the two. It hates this, of course, and takes out its displeasure as acts of profound cruelty on other living creatures it encounters. Night Walkers are not the only form their kind takes. There are a number of barely known types of these entities which are collectively called the Nightshades, and it is a very, very bad situation when more than one is on the same location at the same time working together. We shall talk about that more later in this video. Nightshades are a mixture of death and darkness, possessing an alien intelligence and incredible power of necrotic energy and shadows. They are surrounded by an intense aura of desecration that drains vitality from all living things. They detest and are weakened by sunlight, of course, preferring to operate in darkness. Nightwalkers may be physically huge, but they are also stealthy and silent. They have the ability to fly at will, and so can drift along above the ground, leaving no trace and making no noise. With an outstretched finger, they can target a mortal being within 300 feet with a finger of doom attack. The target must succeed on a DC-21 wisdom saving throw, or take 4d12 necrotic damage and become frightened until the end of the Nightwalker's next turn. While frightened in this way, the creature is also paralysed, so it can't make a sound, not so much as a whimper even though the necrotic damage is excruciatingly painful. As the Nightwalker drifts over to them to apply its deadly touch. If a target's saving throw is successful, the target's immune to the Nightwalker's Finger of Doom for the next 24 hours, but the players don't have to know that automatically. You can let them figure it out on their own. In previous editions of the game, the Nightwalker has access to a broader and more complex range of abilities, which I'll mention here. So, in 3.5 edition, they could turn invisible as the spell three times per day. They could summon undead, typically shadows and wraiths. Though highly intelligent, could cast Cone of Cold once per day, even plane shift once a day. They could use their huge size and supernatural strength to crush physical items between their hands. Even magical items could be crumpled up and destroyed that way, except artifacts, of course. And they essentially gained advantage on any stealth check while in darkness. Their first action in combat was usually to cast Confusion as per the spell and then hold Monster to render its targets pretty much useless. In 4th edition, they were changed considerably, reducing to large size with a cold and necrotic aura at very close range with a void gaze attack that blasted from its eye sockets, knocking opponents back, reducing their defences until they recovered, as well as inflicting necrotic damage, otherwise they were brutes who laid into victims with slam attacks. Their finger of death was also a gaze attack at melee range and reduced already badly wounded foes to zero hit points, bypassing any resistance to necrotic attacks, so it was very clearly intended to go toe to toe with an adventuring party and had a pile of hit points in high armor class to ensure it could take a lot of hits in return. 5th edition has returned to a version closer to the original, but it has left it with its brutish mentality for some reason. I have a solution for that though, more on that in a minute. For old school players, forget about the sensitivity and vulnerability to radiant damage or sunlight. The Nightwalker can operate just as effectively in full sunlight. Aside from that 120 foot dark vision, there's nothing in its stat block that indicates it has any particular advantage or disadvantage from being in either darkness or light. It's still exceptionally durable, with total immunity to poison or necrotic damage, no need to breathe, eat, drink or sleep, immunity to exhaustion, fright, being grappled, paralysed, petrified, restrained or knocked prone, and taking half damage and effect from acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder and any physical attacks that are not magical in nature. They've also now ignore its former vulnerability to silver. It no longer slams victims and objects, it merely touches them with a 15 foot melee reach attack, 
plus 12 to hit one target, which inflicts 5d8 plus 6 necrotic damage. The target must also succeed on a DC 21 constitution saving throw, or its hit point maximum is reduced by an amount equal to the necrotic damage taken. This reduction lasts until the target finishes a long rest. It's a special property of the Nightwalker that any creature reduced to zero hit points from damage dealt by the Nightwalker dies and can't be revived by any means short of a wish spell. This basically means that its soul has been consumed. This is so much worse when you consider that the Nightwalker has that annihilating aura extending out to 30 feet all around it. Any living creature that starts its turn in that area must succeed on a DC 21 constitution saving throw or take 46 necrotic damage and grant the Nightwalker advantage on attack rolls against them until the start of the creature's next turn. So essentially the Nightwalker is a floating assassin of enormous size. Undead are immune to this aura, of course, and although it's not mentioned specifically in 5th edition, this should grant any undead in this aura additional negative energy vitality, regenerating their wounds, increasing their defences, strengthening their resistance to being turned by divine power, perhaps even shielding them from radiant spell attacks. The strength and dexterity of the Nightwalker are both very high, and with a speed of 40 feet per round on the ground or in the air, it's very hard to get away from them once they're intent on destroying something or someone. The Finger of Doom can take some time to recharge, needing a roll of 6 on a 6-sided die in order to be ready to fire again at the start of a round, but you can get lucky as a DM with those rolls. Now, the connection to the being who crossed over into the negative energy plane and released the Nightwalker to inflict its devastation on the material world does have a strange effect on these giant horrors, and I quote, One can discern the nature of creatures trapped in the negative plane from the sights that Nightwalkers frequent. Generally, a Nightwalker on the material plane is attracted to elements of the world associated with the creature responsible for its creation. Such interest doesn't indicate a willingness to engage with the world. Nightwalkers exist to make life extinct and never to serve the living things. That last part is fair warning to would-be necromancer player characters who seek to control them. A dungeon master is completely in their rights to have any control type spells cast by a mortal being simply fizzle and fail against the Nightwalkers. The lowered intelligence score of 6, wisdom of 9 and charisma of 8 may merely indicate that the Nightwalker is just tremendously alien in its mentality. Not that it's weak against any mental domination magic. One of the best ways to complicate the encounter with a Nightwalker is by having the reason for their arrival being intimately tied directly to an important non-player character in the campaign who is now trapped in the negative plane. In order for a trapped creature to escape, the released Nightwalker must be lured back to the negative energy plane by offerings of life for it to devour. If the Nightwalker is destroyed, the trapped creature has no hope of escape. In other lore, the connection with the Nightwalker may persist even if it is banished back to the Shadowfell or negative energy plane, and only casting Remove Curse on the linked individual will free them completely, otherwise they may rebound back to the negative energy plane again once the banishment wears off, which can be fun. Otherwise, to add one hell of an edge to a Nightwalker encounter, you can include one or more of the other Nightshades, as well as some Shadows and Wraiths who travel with the Nightwalker as a pack of loyal entities, feeding on the potent negative energy pouring out of the towering creature. Let's take a look at the other Nightshades, starting with the weakest of them, the Night Haunt. None of the other Nightshades have been updated officially to 5th edition yet, by the way, so this is all subject to change if they ever are at some point after this video is made, but I'll do my best to convey what they're about thematically. The Night Haunt is a sentient undead monster, most often encountered like the Nightwalker on the Plane of Shadow or the Shadowfell. The two places are not always one and the same, thanks to the alterations to the multiverse throughout near narrative time, as opposed to the many different timelines that have been altered over the course of the different editions. Which is to say, if you dive into adventures from earlier editions, the Plane of Shadow may just be a demi-plane formed out of proto-matter that shifts in and out of the ethereal plane, more easily manipulated by dark and sinister powers. Anyway, resembling pitch-black gargoyles, night haunts have keen, extremely evil and strategic minds, and are known to lead armies of undead. It makes perfect sense to me, given the reduced intelligence of the Nightwalkers, that night haunts would team up 
and use them as a master blaster type of partnership. The Nightwalker being the brute that carries the night haunt inside itself, bound together in a twisted mockery of a sentient parasite relationship. An observer might not notice at first that the Nightwalker has another set of dull black eyes peering out from its chest cavity. The night haunt's head is dominated by a long, twisted pair of horns and those large, lifeless black eyes, and a skull without a nose or mouth, just a flat, triangular shape. Like the Nightwalker, they are surrounded by that annihilating aura, otherwise known as the aura of desecration. They do have a vulnerability to sunlight and radiant energy, so using the Nightwalker like an undead tank is certainly logical. They are much more intelligent, capable spellcasters who use confusion, infestation, disease and affliction to reduce their enemies to a state of chaos, and they are capable of summoning a host of lesser undead types. I should also mention that both the Nightwalker and Nighthaunt can use the power of the Shadowfell, concentrated in a profane ritual to turn a mortal victim into a bodak. They can only do this on the Shadowfell, so there is a good chance that they will cross over into the material plane with a few, or have many serving them in the Shadowfell. Night haunts also possess telepathy out to 100 feet, but their signature ability of all of the Nightshades is this power to get up close and personal to drain the soul out of someone they've already weakened considerably from a safe distance. They can fly at 60 feet per round, so they're very quick when they swoop in to grapple a victim, whipping that thin and slightly barbed tail around the victim to hold them tight, much like the face huggers from Alien. They then press their flat head into the victim's face and stare into them with those horrible dead eyes. The victims get to make a DC 18 constitution saving throne, or they immediately lose 46 plus 4 hit points and have their maximum hit points reduced by that same amount. Also, if the Night Haunt manages to do that two rounds in a row, I'd say the victim also suffers a level of exhaustion, so it quickly becomes a very, very serious situation. If they escape and manage to survive the fight, those hit points and levels of exhaustion will restore themselves over the course of a long rest. Personally, I favour the more narrative extended rest, where the adventurers drag themselves back to a safe haven for at least a whole week of recovery, both physical and mental. Having one's soul sucked into the eternal abyss of utter void is about as unpleasant an experience as can be. The character is probably going to have some fear of the dark and wake up screaming on more than a few occasions for the rest of their life. According to the Lost Empires of Faerun sourcebook, night haunts were more common in the ancient days of Amaska, but have been virtually unknown in Faerun since the 14th century DR. However, in Richard Lee Byer's novel Unclean, published in 2007, set in 1375 DR, a night haunt named Yisval led an army of undead with the goal of conquering Thay. Night wings are enormous bat-like forms of nightshades. They have a special ability to drain magic out of items and shatter enchantments, wards and areas of extended magical effect. They do need to make physical contact to do this, but it can really mess up a party of high-level adventurers when they realise that their magic armour, weapons and wondrous items, their precious goodies, are being reduced to nothing more than frost-covered mundane equipment and funny-looking craft items. Like the other nightshades, the Nightwing is no mere riding mount for some greater undead, and the other nightshades have the ability to fly on their own, well, except for the last variety. Nightwings prefer to stay in the air, darkness against darkness, very hard to see unless one notices the stars winking out as the creature passes overhead in the night sky. They gain an excellent vantage point to relay tactical orders to the forces of undeath below them. Again, I see no reason why an army of undeath could not feature these nightwalkers and perhaps a dracolich and a few liches, along with the night haunts, all of them acting as generals and field medics for a horde of doom. If Orcus ever decided to step foot on Torrell directly, you could be sure such an army would accompany him. His moving throne of skeletal undead would be like the calm and silent eye of a cyclone of screaming torments and death. Last, and I think arguably the worst of them all, not seen on the world of Torrell for centuries, is the nightshade called the Nightcrawler, the largest of them all at gargantuan size. A Nightcrawler is a massive behemoth, similar to the purple worm, though utterly black in colour. One of them measures no less than 7 feet in diameter and 100 feet long with its toothy maw to the tip of its stinging tail, weighing a massive 55,000 pounds. 
Along with all the usual stats for a purple worm, including the tremor sense and burrowing speed, the Nightcrawler also has dark vision out to 60 feet and the usual nightshades, annihilating aura, telepathy, a formidable intellect and tremendous physical power. A Nightcrawler attacks by burrowing through the ground and emerging to strike. It has the delightful habit of swallowing targets whole, while necromantic energy reduces their body to a rotted husk. They also consume the soul. Essentially this is the same as the innovating focus attack of the Nightwalker, except it's applied without need of an additional strike roll. Once the Nightcrawler has made that initial bite attack, plus 14 to hit one target, within the 10 foot reach of its maw, if the target is a large or smaller creature it must succeed on a DC 19 dexterity saving throw, or be swallowed whole. Now blinded and restrained with total cover from effects outside the Nightcrawler, it takes 66 necrotic damage at the start of each of the Nightcrawler's turns, and that amount is reduced from their maximum hit points. If the Nightcrawler takes 30 damage or more on a single turn from a creature inside it, the Nightcrawler must succeed on a DC 21 constitution saving throw at the end of its turn or regurgitate all swallowed creatures, which fall prone in a space within 10 feet of the monster. The Tail Stinger gets a stab at a victim every round as well. That doesn't inject venom, it just necrotizes the victim's innards, rotting them from the inside out. It's just the same mechanically as the Purple Worm's attack, except the damage is necrotic and there's no ongoing poison damage. It's just that the target's hit point maximum, again, is reduced by the amount of damage that they take from this brutal, agonizing attack. Personally, I think it's fun to represent the Nightcrawler's power to summon undead by having it vomit out a massive flood of vile, rotten shadow stuff, and from the freezing cold muck that strikes like that of a cone of cold spell, and leaves a great smear of difficult frozen terrain, a number of regurgitated corpses of its former victims rise shaking and twitching as undead, such as whites and greater zombies. Burrowing up from just beneath the surface and releasing a gout of horrid freezing filth and undead minions like an erupting geyser is a pretty effective combat tactic for these cunning, chaotic and evil creatures, as is the ability to burrow through the ground leaving a tunnel 10 feet wide that undead can use to get underneath castle defences and so on. The usual places one encounters such amazingly dangerous monsters is the ruins of a cursed and ruined temple where the good and innocence once gathered in great numbers, left devastated by the arrival of these undead horrors. They gravitate to those locations, but as it is so often, evil necromancers and bumbling high-level wizards who exchange places unexpectedly with these things, you never know where and when exactly an encounter with something like a nightshade is going to happen, considering of course that they often pop into a parallel close dimension of the Shadowfell, right next to the Primaterial Plane. But, it is the mystery and lack of knowledge about these things, which is the one source of the fear that surrounds them. Of course, ironically, knowing the full truth about them is even worse. One place in the Forgotten Realms you are sure to run into a Nightwalker is the ancient ruins of the Jawhat Mountains in Mascari Citadel. Almost destroyed but for its superior technological construction, the former commander of the forces there unleashed a spell so potent against their enemies that it wiped out everyone, including her own troops, and transformed her into a Nightwalker, doomed to stalk the dungeons below the ruin for the rest of time. Whether she still answers to the name Mardava the Artificer is doubtful, but you never know. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for all the full scripts for these videos, buy some sweet merchandise from my Teespring shop, where you'll geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.